Welcome to what is now our second science and conservation event of our 2023-24 program here at ZSL. And this is our first in-person event of this year's events. Um, it's really great to see so many people here when we're this close to Christmas. My name is Sarah Durant. I'm a professor here at the Institute of Zoology at ZSL, and I'm going to be chairing this evening's event on conservation and war. This event has been organised in collaboration with the IECN Specialist Group on Environmental Security and Conflict Law, and we're really grateful for their support. So, as many of you will be aware, armed conflicts have been increasing in recent years, and this not only causes human death and misery, but it also impacts our natural environment. During conflicts, obviously, humanitarian issues will dominate. However, natural resources are key to the well-being of local communities and their recovery out of conflict. And we also have accumulating evidence that suggests linkages between the onset of conflicts and the environment. For example, a recent IUCN report found that the number of armed conflicts in the region was consistently associated with drought and natural resource degradation. ZSL works in multiple conflict-affected countries, um, either past or current conflicts, and they also have impacted my work um, through the Africa Rangewide Cheetah Conservation Initiative. And back in 2008, I was working with the newly established South Sudan government in Zuba to develop our national cheetah and wild dog action plan. And delegates there were reluctant to plan into the future because they were expecting resurgence in conflict. And sadly, they were right. In Benin, our field work has been affected by a rise in terrorism on Benin's northern boundaries with Burkina Faso, whereas in Angola, we are working to help recover biodiversity after decades of conflict. So conservation cannot afford to ignore landscapes and communities that are affected by conflict. Whether we are working with communities to build sustainable livelihoods which can foster against conflict, whether we're finding ways to support communities to conserve vital natural resources through conflicts, or finding ways to support biodiversity recovery after conflicts. Conservationists really need to find better ways of doing conservation in relation to conflicts. So in this event, we're going to explore relationships between conflict and nature conservation. We're going to draw on three case studies to illustrate linkages between conflict and conservation. And we're going to finish up with an introduction to the recent principles on protecting the environment in relation to armed conflict, which have been developed by the International Law Commission. We've got a great lineup of speakers for you this evening who will give four presentations, which will be followed by a question and answer panel session where you'll get your chance to ask, ask your questions. So the first of our speakers is Dr. Susan Canney. Susan has worked on a variety of nature conservation projects across Africa, Asia, and Europe, and as a policy officer for the UK government's independent advice on sustainable development at the Green College Centre for Environmental Policy and Understanding. She has worked in central Mali since 2003, directing the Mali Elephant Project since 2006 to develop an integrated model of human-elephant coexistence. This has endured despite lawlessness, lawlessness, conflict, and insurgency, thanks to a systemic perspective and collaborative approach that seeks to find sustainable solutions to making space for nature while also meeting human needs. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Thank you Sarah. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, Thank you for all for coming. So I'm going to talk about the role of um, local communities in um, nature conservation in conflict areas, um, drawing from our experience in Mali. As, nature, as Sarah said, we've been there since 2003. And the initial focus was very much on elephants. Um, they're an internationally important elephant population. Um, they're one of two desert-adapted um, elephant populations, and they make this the longest annual migration in the world of all elephants over an area of 32,000 kilometers square. So that's about the size of Belgium and Luxembourg combined. And before 2012, there was about 500 of them. This is um, a close-up of West Africa, and I've included it to 
just show where the trafficking routes are, going like this across, across the area. And this is where the elephant range is. So you can see the problem right on top of the trafficking routes. So if we look at a timeline of the project, um, probably the most impactful thing that has happened has been the conflict, which in our area hit complete lawlessness virtually overnight in 2012. This bottom line shows a relative measure using ACLID data of the insecurity. It's not perfect data, but it gives you an idea of how, how that's evolved over that time. And then the impact on the elephants. This shows the number of elephants um, poached each month since poaching began at the beginning of the conflict. Now, there's a lot I could say about that um, graph, lots of things going on that are captured there. Um, that's just showing that that's equivalent to 24 elephants in one month, given there's only 500 to start with. Um, but perhaps that's, this is the most um, kind of striking thing. After having two years of intense poaching, suddenly poaching drops right off. So two striking things which still um, astonish me. The project has been able to work continuously through this time, the only project that's been able to do so and that poaching has been contained and these elephants are still there. How is this possible? Well, I'm going to argue that this is because of a local engagement with local populations, but not just that, the, the process involved in doing that. So this, this, um, this red arrow, that, corresponds, that coincides with when an anti-poaching unit was fully operational in the area, but the reason it had that impact was very much because of the local people and the information they were providing to that, to that um, unit because of their buy-in. So if we rewind to 2003, when um, I first got there, it was very clear there was a, there was, it's amazing in an area because it's so large, a big diversity of habitats right from dense thicket forest to you know, these great majestic sand dunes and a big diversity of people, many different ethnic groups coinciding in this area. And if we take a satellite image, you can see the River Niger um, around the top here. And these lines are the, the tracks of um, elephants, and this is their migration route. They spend the dry season in the north of the area where there are very small ephemeral water points. And then in the wet season, they go down to the south where the food is much better. But once it stops raining, there's no longer any water. And on superimposed on that, they're avoiding human activities. Um, but so after three years of studies in 2006, we understood what was happening, but what can you do over such a vast area? They needed the whole of that migration to survive. We had no money at all. The government had no money and no interest, no resources. What do you do? So what we did was um, talk to the local people to try and understand their attitudes. We did an attitude survey. We had many workshops to, to talk about our findings. And we found two key attitudes. One was that they didn't want elephants to disappear because they said if elephants disappear, it means the environment is no longer good for us. They also very well understood that human activity must be conducted within biophysical limits of the environment. And when I heard these two, I kind of thought, this is something we're trying to um, convey back home. Perhaps we've got something that we can do here. But when you go out into the environment, it's overexploited, it's degraded, looks like this. So what's happening here? There's a, a, there's a, there's a dispar disparity between what they're thinking, what they feel, and what they're doing. Uh, so what is the incentive structure that leads to this? So we conducted further economic surveys um, to understand this. Again, two key findings. One was that there was a very high degree of resource exploitation by outside commercial interests coming from urban areas hundreds, hundreds of kilometers away, like this wood lorry. And the other thing was that while individual ethnic groups have their own systems of, of resource management, they were reluctant to respect those of another ethnic group. And so, in fact, there was no um, environmental management at all. So what we did was we held local stakeholder meetings. We asked people about what were their problems um, that they were facing on a day-to-day -day basis. We talked about the elephants. We fed back. We talked about the results of our study. And they talked about this until they reached a common understanding of the problems of their area. And that created a kind of unity among these ethnic groups. So then we could say, well, what needs to be done? 
And they said, well, we need systems that everybody respects. So he said, what do those systems look like? Well, they have to include everybody, they have to be representative, they have to be transparent, they have to be equitable. So there's a whole conversation about that. And they said, we'll put those in place. So they do that. They put in place their traditional, based on their traditional structures, management committee of elders, teams of young men who patrol, and involving activities that they know how to do already. So this is using existing assets. You don't need to train or bring in anything else. This is things they know how to do. So if we take, for example, um, pasture management, they're setting aside big areas of reserve pasture, which the young men are p um, building fire breaks to protect, and stops fire. This means that they have pasture at the end of the dry season, when it's very, very expensive to buy in forage. They can sell grazing access rights. They can um, sell hay. The women can take it to market and sell hay. And it prevents over-exploitation by outside interests and makes them some income. More resources mean, uh, as well as leaving space for elephants, they also have more possibility for income generating activities. Small generate, this is, this is an example, particularly by women's associations. But we knew right from the beginning that there was an issue of enforcement. You know, if they have to face armed, armed herders, for example, they need support in that. And so what we did was we worked with the government, it took 10 years, but to create a protected area over the whole of this area, it's 42,000 kilometers squared, on a biosphere reserve model, which means that you have core protected areas, strictly protected, but these big multi-use areas, the legislation for that was actually the legislation developed by local communities. And what this did was that it gave a mandate for government foresters and the military to actually come and support local people in their enforcement if need be. So there's a, lot, there's a big high degree of local ownership of this reserve because this helps them take control of their own natural resources and prevent outsiders coming in, for example, and clearing a forest. So this, this slide is just to... Um, just to show that how an environmental governance system kind of developed, we could start with decentralization legislation. Mali had decentralization legislation, which puts natural resources under the control of local people, but they need help in, in drafting the legal documents. So we were able to help them with that and develop local management systems that were very adapted to the local situation. And then these could be reinforced by working at the commune level. So we're working at two levels at once. They're mutually supporting each other and they're mutually watching over each other to make sure things are done properly. And then that created more needs. So we could have the protected area legislation to help with the enforcement. And they helped with the enforcement of that. And also um, they provided the information that anti-poaching and trafficking activities needed to be able to be effective and as a act as a deterrent. So what started with a uh, focus on elephants um, and trying to make, uh, to mediate human elephant coexistence to mutual benefit, actually ended up um, improving livelihoods and reducing poverty. Um, it provided respected occupations for the youth in regenerating natural resources and the youth are absolutely central to this. It provides them occupations and it improves social cohesion because different groups had to come together to be able to, to act together. So these multiple synergistic benefits kind of created a big support for elephant conservation, which was associated with this. And together, that fed into um, enforced law enforcement when it came to anti-poaching and trafficking and also the reserve management. The government didn't have to do that. Community um, agreements actually did that and, and, and promoted this engagement between community and law enforcement. So if we go back to our original diagram, um, uh, just a, a recap on what happened. So we started with scientific studies to understand the ecological system and how humans were inserting and in, interacting with that, followed by um, community, social engagement, understanding local attitudes and the socio-economic aspects, and then followed by actual action on the ground, you know, community engagement to, to make something happen. And as I, and as I, as I said, 
this, the local engagement, the process of that was actually fundamental to what happens here. There were several things going on here, which I would take a, another presentation to describe, but it's that local engagement that meant that we could do this, you know, bring the poaching level down. So in summary, I just wanted to make a few points. Don't forget the power of the local. Often local people are thought of as victims, they're poor, they, they don't have any agency, but actually they know what's happening in their local area. They know what's possible. They have an interest in things working out, unlike many people in, sitting in government offices, and especially in times of conflict when their opportunities are, are reduced. And they're also close enough to what's happening that they can oversee, they can watch and police. You don't, like, you don't need massive, expensive enforcement. They can, they can monitor. Second point, so to, do, to get them on side is to try to shift the incentive structure. And to do that, you need to understand the incentive structure. So you've got to go beyond what the, the, the appearance of what's happening to what's really happening behind the scenes. And to do that, you need to be willing to know, not to know. I think because that forces you to really go down, study what's happening, listen to people, dialogue, and co-develop co solutions. If I'd been asked to write a plan in 2006 as to what was needed for the elephants, it wouldn't have looked like what happened, and it would certainly not be working right now. It would have fallen by the wayside a long time ago. And just a final point is that, that the quality of the process is key to the sustainability of the outcome. So these are just, if you want to know more, these are two um, articles. Uh, this is uh, more in-depth, and this is a, a quicker one. The references are on those little cards that um, were at reception, if you're interested to know more. So I just have to thank all our donors and partners, and thank you all very much for listening. Hi, um, thank you for your talk. Um, you said about the locals and um, listening to what they have to say and um, you know, getting basic resources. My, my question, because I've studied a lot of supply chains tracing back for certain products to Africa and India and even South America. My question is, is that when we're talking about armed conflict, when we're also looking at this um, maybe you're aware of this, when we're looking at this transition to a Green New Deal, a lot of people that do not seem to be aware that for us to get these minerals for a Green New Deal, you need armed conflict. We didn't get these resources out of Afghanistan or Iraq just by rocking up to Baghdad and say, can we have the resources? We invaded those countries, but we needed the minerals from those countries. We needed the lithium and the cobalt from Africa to actually put into the fighter pilot jets, to put into the helmets, to put into all this military hardware for the military complex, so we can go into those countries and actually take their resources by the stealth force. So my question is, is that we want to help save the planet, we want the right thing for the Africans and the Indians, all these people, even the Ukrainians. But at the same time, there seems to be this hypocrisy where we also want the resources as well. If we want the resources, then we have to be we have to put up with the shit that's going to go down as well. So, is there any comprehension of these supply chains and how most of these people that you're helping to actually repatriate to their land, actually the land that they need to be repatriated to is the land they've lost because of the West's needs for their resources? Thank you. Yeah. Um, hmm. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's a huge issue. I mean, it is not so much the case here, what you're talking about, because um, these people are here and they have to be there. They can't go anywhere else. I mean, the people who have left are the more educated generally who can afford to, but the people, the, most people can't, and so they're left here. So, I mean, what you, you make very valid points, and I'm not sure what I can say about that. Um, I think this the idea of the Green New Deal and the need for minerals is an enormous problem that people are, are, are almost like 
willingly not wanting to see because it messes up um, a conception of a way to get out of the environmental mess we're in without fundamentally changing our economic and governance systems. You know, that just seems too big an ask. And so people are almost like crossing their fingers and, and hoping that um, we can somehow keep our growth model um, and just replace, you know, fossil fuels with renewable energy or whatever. Last, when I spoke to people in South Africa last month in Cape Town, and I says, do you know about all this climate change stuff? He says, no, tell me. And I says, well, you know, the West wants to divest from fossil fuels. And they look at me like, are you crazy? How are we going to survive without fossil fuels? We don't make anything without burning fossil fuels. The whole of Africa survives on burning fossil fuels. You, you want your lithium and your cobalt and wind turbines. We burn fossil fuels here so you can get it for 10 a penny over in the UK. So, again this transition from fossil fuels to renewables built on burning fossil fuels, the first people to actually get completely screwed over is going to be the people who are mining the resources. So I think we really need to have a serious conversation with people from Africa and India at the table and actually saying, is this what you want? And most times they'll be like, no, because 99% of the products we're mining is for export to the rest of the world. We don't use it. Well, well, yes. I mean, I, I, I agree. Um, I, I can't. <laughs> I can't really say more than that. <laughs> we do need to move on to the next. We need to move on to the next talk. Um, so our second speaker is Dr. Henrika Schultito Borne. Have I found? <laughs> Henny is a postdoctoral research associate at the Institute of Zoology. She uses satellite imagery to investigate how people change whole landscapes especially through climate change and land use changes such as deforestation. She has previously worked as a researcher for the Conflict and Environmental Observ Observatory, CEOPS, where she undertook the work that she's going to be presenting here. Welcome, Henny. Yes, let's start there. Um, but before I start, I just want to give a big thanks to all the collaborators who made this work possible, um, and all my fo former colleagues at CEOPS, because all that work that I'm going to talk about now uh, was carried out whilst I was working for them. So I'm going to be talking about Tigray. Tigray is a state in northern Ethiopia. It's a very dry area. Um, <laughs> And it has undergone, throughout the end of the 20th and the beginning of the 21st century, an incredible landscape recovery. So we know this because, um, luckily, the Italians did a military expedition there at the sort of middle of the 19th century, and they took lots of photos, um, probably to work out where all the good resources were. And then 140 years later, a group of scientists found all those places where those photos were taken and took photos from exactly the same vantage point, and you can work out how the landscape have changed, has changed. And what they worked out is that there was this incredible resurgence of vegetation that is sort of counter the desertification narrative that we hear um, a lot. So what happened in Tigray? Well, a lot, lots of different things, and this was all kind of driven um, from bottom-up processes, very much local people giving their time and their money to do this. But it was a combination of things, putting in hard infrastructure to reduce erosion, so for example, stone buns along steep slopes to kind of slow down the flow of the water, reduce erosion, keep the water in the landscape, ponds, small dams, stuff like that. Then there were grazing exposures that people voluntarily agreed upon not grazing their cattle in certain areas to allow the regeneration of trees. And they also did active tree planting in many areas. And all of that together led to this vegetation recovery. And vegetation in Tigray acts a bit like a sponge. It keeps the water in the landscape for longer. And that means it is available for agriculture as well. So this actually had, there are some papers that show very nicely how this had an effect on agricultural yields and therefore on people's livelihoods in an area that is affected by a lot of food insecurity. Um, and now is the part where the story gets a bit sad. So. Um, yeah, then with the start of the Tigray conflict um, in November 2020, a lot of this was kind of called into question. Um, this conflict is a sort of civil war um, pitting federal Ethiopian forces and Eritrean forces on one side um, against the Tigray People's Liberation Front on the other. 
Um, there has been a truce agreement as of late last year, but actually peace in the sense of people can go about their lives in a and, and are not encumbered by conflict, that is still very elusive. Um, and the reasons for that are multifaceted, but there was, for instance, there was um, uh, a really severe blockade for years, so there was no import of fuels, no import of food or fertilizer, um, agricultural productivity plummeted, and there was um, widespread famine, um, and displacement of civilians. Um, and you also had a communication blackout. So for months there was no, no internet, uh, no, no, no telephone, no banking services. It's very hard for people in the area to communicate with people outside the area and vice versa to talk about what was going on. Um, and as an ecologist or for, as a conservation scientist, there is immediately two things that, that kind of caught, caught, catch my attention here which is a lack of fuel imports into the region, and then this communication blackout. And then immediately I thought, well, could there maybe be, you know, people, because people still need fuel, they still need to cook, they still need to heat their homes, is one of the resources that they could and should use in that case, um, maybe local uh, timber, local woods, and does that mean that we might have widespread deforestation that is kind of working against all these environmental gains that we've had in the past 10, 20 years. Um, but obviously, because there's a communication blackout, and even for people in the area, it's really dangerous to go into more rural areas, um, we, we don't know. So how serious is this problem? Um, so we can't do field work. What can we do now? Well, we can wait until the war's over, but that might take a long time. Um, and it is also worth um, working out the impacts of of armed conflict as it is happening to raise awareness of, I mean, this is, this is by far not the worst impact of this war, but it is one of the impacts of the war and it um, deserves being talked about. Um, and we have, but we have remote sensing technology that can help us um, look at what's happening on the ground without actually having to go there. Um, and that is because there are satellites that take repeated images of basically the entire Earth's surface. And um, by looking at the changes in this data, we can um, infer environmental changes that might be related to the war. So to do this, we looked at two things. First, we worked out what the tree and shrub cover was before the war, so what was our status quo that we started with, the baseline. And then using a very long-term data set of satellite data that spanned several years, we could look at changes in vegetation uh, cover and condition during the war. That doesn't, base, that doesn't necessarily tell us that the war caused this, but we can at least say during the time period of this armed conflict, this is what happened to the vegetation. And satellites can help us um, do both of these things. So um, we made a land cover map of forests and other wooded areas. Um, that was valid for just before the war. And then we looked at areas where there were sudden declines in greenness, because you can imagine if there's an area with lots of trees and then you have a sudden persistent decline of greenness, that could mean that trees have disappeared. And I'm not gonna go into the methodology here, but this is the outcome. So this is a map of the tree and shrub cover before the war across Tigray. And you can see um, it's very heterogeneous. It doesn't really conform to, to the climate zones. Very complex system. Um, and um, Tigray is about 50,000 square kilometers. So uh, we achieved an overall accuracy of 88%, which means that in 88% of cases, if you picked a pixel at random, that pixel was assigned the correct land cover ca category. So that's pretty good for an area of kind of that size. Um, and then we had to look at where vegetation condition changed. So we used an indicator here called NDVI, but uh, that's, you don't have to remember that. It's basically an indicator for greenness. Um, and the, the, the problem or the complexity in areas like Tigray is that you have seasonal changes of greenness because obviously there's a wet season and there's a dry season. So just because there's some change in greenness doesn't mean anything interesting has happened. Um, but when vegetation declines or struggles, there's a persistent decline of this kind of fluctuation. So you still have fluctuation, but it happens at a lower level. And in the same way, if vegetation expands, if you have more trees growing, you might see the same fluctuations, but at a much higher level. 
And there are some algorithms that can pick up on exactly these signals and can say, okay, we've had, a, we've had a significant decline here or a significant increase, and that is sort of beyond what we would expect from seasonal changes. So we looked at both of these cases across Degray, and this is what you get. So this is a, a map of tree and shrub cover and condition change across all of Tigray, across the entire war period that we assessed. So from the start of 21 to September 22. Um, and you can see that it's very, to have these hotspots of potential vegetation loss in the, in the south east. And, um, and then very close to that, potential areas of actually vegetation gain. And that's, that's really interesting from a, from a sort of conservation perspective um, that clearly vegetation recovery is still, you know, that's not incompatible with, with, um, with conditions of um, armed conflict. But it's very difficult to say, you know, is this, maybe this is just a normal year. Maybe that's always what it looks like for Tigray. You know, if you, if you looked at 2017 or 2018, that's exactly the picture that you would get. So to work that out, we looked at um, different years. So in red, you can see the percentage of the land that was affected by significant declines. And in gray, you can see the percentage of the land that was affected by significant increases. And you can see that during the war, increases have increased, decreases, that there are many more decreases than in a normal year before, let's say 2020, or in a very wet year, like 2019. But we do also see some vegetation recovery. It's less, it's, it's even more than we see in 2020, for instance. So those are, that's really good news for vegetation across Tigray. So we've shown that, yes, there have been some vegetation declines during the war, but that doesn't mean that it happens, um, that they happened because of the war, because there can be very many different drivers for declines in tree or shrubs. Differences in rainfall, wildfire, locust um, invasions, and, and such. And I won't go into all of these, but whenever we looked at the, the overlap in space between those potential drivers and the hotspots of where we saw vegetation declines, they didn't really match. So we think, well, it's unlikely, it's, un, it's not impossible, but it's unlikely that they are to blame. Just as an example, um, uh, we looked at drought conditions. So you can take a very long time series of precipitation and you can work out what the expected precipitation is for any point in time. Then you can take the observed rainfall and you can work out has there been more or less rainfall than you would expect for this point in time. Um, and then you can plot this deficit against the change in greenness. So you would expect if you have much more um, rainfall than you expected, you would see much more increases in greenness. And if you have much less, Rainfall then expected, you would see um, many more declines in greenness. So you would expect a kind of strong relationship. But when we plotted those two things, it was really just sort of a data cloud. So that doesn't mean that rain doesn't play any role, but it probably means it's not the main driver of the changes that we see here. And most importantly, we had some anecdotal evidence from people within Tigray who managed to get in touch with us, who actually did report that they observed people go out to local woodlands, cut down the shrubs and trees to make firewood, and especially charcoal, and that was then, um, that was then transported into the cities, for instance. So what is the impact of all of this on Tigray? So in those areas where we see a lot of vegetation decline, there may be a potential loss or reduction in food security and livelihoods because the landscape will have locally lost this capacity to retain water and soil. And that means also that there might be a loss of resilience to drought and because that this area is probably going to be quite severely affected by climate change, that is, that is worrying. And also the war has led to an erosion of all the human institutions that have enabled these, the, the landscape restoration. You know, the networks of people that work together and trust each other that know the area, the tree nurseries that supply the saplings, you know, all the, all the, all the organization that you need to organize something like a grazing exposure, that has been um, probably devastated by, you know, widespread displacement of people. So that's also not great news for Tigray. Um, so what then needs to happen after the conflict, or hopefully as we move into an area of more peace? So clearly we need ground-based assessments. 
in Tigray, but also other areas of Ethiopia that have been affected by this conflict. This is, this can help us, this remote sensing type of analysis can help us pinpoint where might be hotspots of change, but they don't tell us the whole story. So it's important to go back, and I've, now I've seen, um, I've seen papers come out of, um, of researchers from um, Tigray who have actually um, start, started their research programs back up, so this, this process is now happening. Um, then it is very important to highlight that the environmental cover, recovery should really be part of the overall recovery of Tigray from this conflict because it is key to building food security and resilience in this area. And clearly we need to rebuild all the infrastructure that supports landscape restoration. And that clearly doesn't just mean uh, rebuilding destroyed stone bonds, but it also means rebuilding the destroyed institutions that have enabled um, people in Tigray to carry out this this amazing landscape restoration before. Yep, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Henry. Um, time for one question. Yeah. Where did the original input for this incredible recovery come from? I mean, I'm mm. curious to know. And across the Sahel, the Sahel are there any, because one is led to believe there is such a vast band of degradation and environmental loss. Are there any other places that have this sort of amazing transformation? Um, so I can't, I can't speak to that. I'm sorry, I'm not, not an expert on, on the whole of Sahel, but um, with regards to where, the, where the, um, the resources came from, so it was, I believe, kind of both at a national and then also at a regional level, something that people were interested in because the normal kind of agricultural subsidies just weren't working for Tigray. Um, and they realized they needed to rehab rehabilitate the landscape um, if they wanted to address food security. <coughs> and then it was mainly, it was actually local people's time and, and, uh, and, and resources. So there was a program where people would donate um, labor in exchange for um, I think sometimes food aid, if not, if not money, so they would then work and build these stone buns, for instance, um, locally and do that. So it was very much, it was very much, yeah, lo um, regionally at least driven. Thanks. Um, so our next speaker is Doug Weir. Doug is the research and policy director of the Conflict and Environment Observatory. He's undertaken research and advocacy on the environmental legacy of armed conflicts and military activities since 2005. He has contributed to a wide range of domestic, regional and international initiatives on conflict and the environment, with a particular focus on the work of the UN Environment, or just environment Assembly and on the development of legal framework protecting the environment in relation to armed conflicts. Thank you, Doug. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about some of our research on Ukraine um, and particularly the impact on its protected areas, uh, which have been quite significant. So just very briefly, we're a, a charity. We're based up in uh, Wild West Yorkshire, um, and we focus on monitoring conflicts and also looking at the environmental consequences of military activities more broadly. So some of this is conflict monitoring, but also undertaking specific bits of research as well as advocacy at different international fora. So for my talk, I'm just going to talk about sort of four key areas. So firstly, around uh, Ukraine's ecologically important areas, uh, then look a little bit of a kind of harm which we've seen uh, since 2022, but also previously. Uh, some examples and case studies, and then just a few observations afterwards. So just by way of introduction, um, Ukraine had a reasonably well-developed protected area network. Um, it's very ecologically rich. It's around 6% of Europe's land area, but has around 35% of its biodiversity, which equates to something like 70,000 species. Around 6.8% of Ukraine is legally protected under domestic legislation currently. Um, so this excludes some of the prospective Emerald Network sites, which are currently being integrated. Um, and this figure also excludes 47 Ramsar sites and eight UNESCO biosphere reserves. Um, so while we're obviously focused on the ongoing conflict since the full-scale invasion in uh, February 2022, 
Obviously, there'd been conflict in Ukraine prior to that. So large areas of eastern Ukraine had been damaged. We've seen the annexation of Crimea. And this has affected a lot of its nature reserves and important wildlife areas um, prior to 2022. Since 2023, we've seen around 2,000 conservation areas either temporarily occupied or remain occupied, and hundreds have been directly or indirectly damaged. And we'll see some of this damage momentarily. So when we think about damage during conflict, what have we seen in Ukraine? So obviously every conflict is different. They have different environmental footprints. What we see in Tigray is very different to what we see in Ukraine, to what we see in Mali. But for the case of Ukraine, we've seen is this direct damage. So this might be fire, blast, mechanical damage, landscape disruption from tracked vehicles, chemical pollution, dispersal of unexploded ordnance, and also acoustic disturbance as well. We also see damage caused by occupation, so that might be looting of equipment or resources, um, impacts on staff who may be held hostage, who may be killed. Um, we see a lack of park management during these periods. And in addition to these direct and occupation-linked harms, we also see many indirect harms. So a country at war is not in generally focusing on its biodiversity. We also see huge loss and displacement of staff who might be internally or internationally displaced. We see impaired environmental governance at the national level. We see economic losses for where parks or areas were reliant on tourism. And we also see a lack of, sort of research and ongoing activities which you see in protected areas. In addition, domestic or international programs, so you see a lot of partnerships and collaborations between international conservation organizations may come to a halt. All of these have environmental consequences for protected areas. So just to pull out one of these forms of direct damage, when we look at fires, so about 25% of Ukraine's ecologically important areas, so this isn't just designated protected areas, but a whole suite of important areas, have experienced landscape fires since February 2022. And 60% of these were within 30 kilometers of the front line, so likely to be directly linked to the fighting itself. So this is a map which uh, colleagues at Zoe Environment Network in uh, Switzerland uh, have developed, which is for a forthcoming briefing um, which we hope to get out soon. So they tracked incidents at protected areas and in ecologically important areas. So uh, the different colors, the darker the color, the more severe the damage, and the larger the, the circle, also the more severe the damage. This is a draft, by the way, but it gives you an indication of whereabouts in Ukraine most of the damage has been centered. And obviously, it's along the front lines, and it tracks the areas where Russia invaded and occupied and where the fighting currently is. So when we think about some of the damage itself, so this is some of the data we put together um, from we undertake open source monitoring and research. So we use social media, we use satellite imagery to try and track incidents in areas where it's unsafe to actually visit directly. So on the left-hand side, we see this Drevlyansky Nature Reserve. So this is around 70 kilometers west of Chernobyl. You'll recall uh, Russia occupied the Chernobyl uh, nuclear power plant and Chernobyl exclusion zone right at the start of the conflict. So we saw fires which have been started by battles which were fought in the reserve uh, in around February and March 2022. And then later more fires in May which we believe are associated with unexploded ordnance which can cause forest fires. So in total around 21 square kilometers of the park was burnt and this is around 7% 7, 7 of it. And obviously it's home to a rare wildlife and species. One of the other key issues here with fires is that because of its proximity to Chernobyl, the soil is contaminated with radionuclides. So fires present a potential exposure risk. And also when you lose the vegetation cover, it increases erosion and transport of these radionuclides. So below there, we see the uh, Kimburn spit, or sorry, to the right. Uh, so this is a spit at the bottom of uh, Kherson down in the southeast of Ukraine. Um, it has multiple different designations around this whole area. It's quite a fragile and unique habitat. Um, unfortunately, as far as the conflict is concerned, the spit is actually quite strategically located in terms of access to the southern Bur and Dnipro rivers. It's also in proximity to Mykolaiv. So it's currently occupied, remains occupied, and has been used to shell areas to the north on the mainland. Um, so we've seen fires caused by the firing points of weapons where uh, artillery pieces are fired, for example, or multiple launch rockets, but also incoming fire as well from Ukraine. So 
During 2022, fires affected around 10,000 hectares, um, which was the worst fire season since 2001. Not all of this landscape is as ecologically rich as other parts, um, but at the same time, we've seen this increased level of fires and reduced capacity to actually deal with these fires. So firefighting equipment had been lost or damaged, uh, and in some cases, Russian troops prevented local communities dealing with wildfires, increasing the amount of damage that was caused. So moving on to the Holy Mountains Nature Park. So this is in the eastern, eastern Ukraine and covers around 40,000 hectares. So it's wooded chalk terraces uh, along the Sibirsky Donetsk River Valley. And there's also a mixture of steppe and woodlands and uh, wetlands. Around 91% of it is wooded. It's not one single park, it's quite fragmented, but it houses at least 13 ecologically important areas and uh, institutions along with settlements and cultural monuments. It's very close to the town of Liman, which you may have heard of, which is a railhead which was strategically important. And so we saw a great deal of fighting uh, in May 2022 when Russia tried to take the area and successfully took the area. And then in the autumn, Ukraine undertook a counter-offensive. So forest areas within the park were used as cover um, by tanks and mechanized infantry. Um, saw a huge amount of damage to woodlands and forests within the area. Uh, and around 80% of the park's buildings were destroyed in the process. So the park remains littered with UXO, and we've seen quite a lot of damage to these quite fragile and unique chalk slopes within the park. So from land, it's not just a case of terrestrial protected areas being damaged, we've also seen damage to uh, marine protected areas. So this one is just to the south of Kherson and Kimburn Spit, which you can see up in the top right-hand corner. And it's Zernov's Phylophora field. So Phylophora is a kind of uh, red algae that lives in the Black Sea, lives on the sea floor at depths of around 70 meters and creates quite important habitats for a whole range of species. So the Zernov's Phylophora field is home to at least nine endangered species of algae, fish and crustaceans, plus around four to seven other species of fish and 110 species of recorded invertebrates. So a protected area was established in 2008, and it covers around 4,000 kilometers square, which is equivalent to around 12.5% of the northwestern shelf of the Black Sea. So these pink hexagons throughout are the locations of different incidents which have occurred during the conflict. So it might be sinkings, for example, of the flagship, the Moskva. Um, there's also an oil and gas platform, down the BK-1 platform down there, which has been on fire. Uh, since June 2022 and remains on fire. And so we've also seen impacts from the Kohovka Dam disruption, which I'll come on to in a minute. So there's a range of different incidents throughout the conflict which may have affected this area, but currently it's very difficult, not impossible, to assess uh, any impacts. So moving on to the Kohovka Dam flood. Um, so this had upstream and downstream impacts on protected areas. So. Upstream, we saw uh, a number of protected areas which had been created when the Kovka Reservoir was created. Uh, these were lost in their entirety. Downstream, we've seen six areas of ecological importance impacted, most notably the Dnipro Delta, which was a Ramsar wetland. Although it's a wetland, the quantity of water coming down and the amount of pollution and sediment that it carried mean that it was far greater than a seasonal flood event, for example. So what are the lessons we've learnt? So this is obviously a high intensity mechanised conflict, huge amounts of explosive force being used, slow moving front lines which measure hundreds of kilometres long. At the same time we've seen this unprecedented international interest in its environmental consequences for a whole range of reasons. A lot of focus on future accountability and reparations, obviously this requires data. Remote analysis has limitations which particularly when it comes to trying to track impacts on nature, it's very difficult to do that from satellites alone. But field access is, remains constrained because of the presence of unexploded ordnance, the front lines themselves. So one thing we looked at was to try and improve a digital map of protected areas in Ukraine. And this is what colleagues came up with. Um, this uses a range of open sources as well as uh, other data on official areas. So this is ecologically important areas as well as designated protected areas, but it gives some indication of where the most important uh, locations are. And this is data which we can use in our mapping work. We also did the same for the Black Sea, again, bringing together different data sets to identify ecologically important areas. 
So just to conclude, so the scale of damage to Ukraine's ecologically important areas is vast and consequences will last decades. We see that from other intense battlefields like World War I or from Vietnam. In many cases, these will be irreversible harms which have been caused. Um, Ukraine's conservationists will need ongoing international support to help ensure recovery uh, and also to understand what the impacts are, many of which may last multiple seasons. One thing that's clear is that nature should be a key part of Ukraine's recovery, but this will obviously create land use conflicts. So what should you do with the extremely damaged, valuable agricultural land? Should it be left to rewild? Uh, is it too expensive to clear of unexploded ordnance or to remove craters, for example? Where should be prioritized for landmine removal and unexploded ordnance clearance? What should you do about dams? Should they be rebuilt or left to rewild, having already caused environmental damage when they were built? But also, how do we sustain attention on the environment during recovery, which will be the work of decades? And then finally, what does protection mean in the context of high-intensity armed conflicts? What can we do to protect protected areas and important areas for nature? Uh, we've got some thoughts on that in a recent paper, which is down there in the International Review of the Red Cross, which looks at some of these issues uh, in conflict. So I shall leave it there. Um, but yeah, check us out online if you like more info. Thanks very much. Really interesting talk. Just to play the devil's advocate, is there a possibility that you could get some new interesting habitats forming from the armed conflict situations, especially when it comes to sort of areas of fire? Um, yes. I think there were a lot of habitats in Ukraine which were anthropogenic. So uh, conifer plantations, for example, which weren't necessarily particularly rich in biodiversity, which may have been heavily affected by fires and front lines. Um, so in that respect, yeah, I think that's almost the issue we're trying to determine. Environmental harm in conflicts is that understanding that nature's not static, right? Very few of these uh, ecosystems are static climax ecosystems, but then everything's changing anyway with climate change and everything else. So yeah, I think that's often the case, and we see that in other areas. But sometimes what comes back may well be a lot poorer. So sometimes damage may facilitate the in, uh, invasive species, for example. So what you get back will be different, but it may not be richer. Great, thanks. 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 Um, so our final speaker this evening is Professor Khan Holm. Um, Khan is the chair of the IUCN Environmental Security and Conflict Law Specialist Group, and she's based at the University of Essex. She specializes in the legal protection of the environment in relation to armed conflict. She researches on international humanitarian law, environmental human rights, environmental security, post-conflict obligations and transitional justice, the legality of specific weapons, as well as climate change, biodiversity, and nature protection, oceans and protected areas. Thanks, Khan. Thank you, everybody, uh, for coming uh, tonight. It's, uh, as you said, it's a really interesting uh, occasion. Uh, and I have the pleasure to introduce you to the law uh, and the last of the four speakers in a really hot room. So um, hopefully, hopefully you'll still be with me in a few minutes' time. So I'm tasked with, I think, different than the previous three speakers who have given us, uh, I think, really interesting, really rich descriptions of uh, one, well, three different, very different Conflicts, three very different environments as well, um, and on a very, very local level as well. And then, of course, we moved to Doug's, which was the, the previous presentation, which is looking at uh, practically the, uh, uh, well, the whole of Ukraine. So from, from the legal dimension, uh, we really go right to that level, I think, that, that Doug really focused on, which is in relation to the main laws of armed conflict are, are really designed for that high intensity warfare. They do apply to the, the more low intensity warfare, uh, but they tend to be much more focused on the notion of this uh, interstate armed conflict. So I wanted to start first by asking how is uh, environmental damage caused during armed conflict? So I'm sure we all have lots of images 
in our heads, but of course uh, in the media in the last few years, at least in the last 30 to 40 years, there have been lots of images I'm sure that we can all conjure up. So I'm going to try throughout the, well, the next 10 minutes just to focus on some of the key ones, but also try to focus a little bit more on, on this notion of protected areas. And what, what does the law do in relation to protected areas that my other colleagues here have, have mentioned during their talks? Uh, so the primary pathways then uh, to, well, to, to damage during armed conflict, uh, thinking about this from, from the military perspective, there is, first of all, the direct attack on the environment. Thankfully, we don't tend to see that so much now. We saw that much more, of course, uh, in days gone. Uh, in particular, uh, what brings to my mind is Vietnam, for example, direct attacks on forest, uh, where there's an argument that it, it is classifiable as, a, as what's called a military objective. So as I say, it's much more unusual today. More likely is what we've tended to see in, in a lot of more, again, high intensity conflicts is what's called collateral damage. So it's an attack, a targeting uh, of a military objective. And for this reason, um, it, it's lawful in armed conflict so far. The question then becomes, what are these collateral damages that the law allows? What scale of side effects does the law allow? And when it comes to uh, the environment, uh, there is a, a concept called proportionality, and you have to uh, keep the side effects, the collateral damage, within a certain uh, well, scale. But it's very difficult to measure. It's difficult enough to measure when you're targeting, say, an industrial facility or an oil facility, and there, and there are civilian people nearby. It's really difficult when you're talking about what is the scale of permitted damage uh, to the environment. So an oil spill, for example, uh, you know, on the whole of the Lombardese coast as was a few years back. So we tend to see a lot of environmental damage caused through these attacks on oil facilities, chemical facilities, for example, where we see lots of uh, chemical contaminants in the air, the river, the soils, and these can, of course, have long-lasting impacts. But according to the laws of war, they can be perfectly lawful. The third, uh, third main pathway tends to be weapons. So again, I think we're all very familiar with the very uh, high polluting ones like nuclear, chemical, biological. And then as Doug mentioned, you know, things, you've got things like landmines, cluster bombs that can again release chemicals or well, release their explosive effects and chemicals into the environment for many years. Uh, they're also uh, much more lower, low tech. Uh, so basic knives and, and, and machetes, for example, have, have been used in a lot of armed conflicts. So whilst they may not have the scale of damage that we, you know, we tend to see with nuclear, for example, we associate with nuclear weapons, they, they've tended to be in, in, in low-tech conflicts. And that has actually had much more of an impact on endangered species because it, it tends to have been related to non-state armed groups uh, that have taken a very um, keen interest, let's say, in poaching. And then I think... So all the laws of armed conflict are geared towards this notion of the conduct of hostilities, what I've talked about so far, the limitations on weapons, the limitations on targets. Where we see most of the environmental impacts, though, and this is where the laws of armed conflict fall down, really, that they don't, they don't really look at this, the last two dimensions, are what we call the military footprint of war. So all the incidental environmental damage that occurs just from having you know, thousands of troops stationed in an area, heavy vehicles, for example, plowing through the deserts, uh, desert soils, for example, weapons maneuvering across the battlefield, possibly through forests, uh, those sorts of things, impacts on local uh, marine spaces because of warships and, and similar. And then finally, what we call the governance vacuum, which is literally um, the, the, the lack of law and order that keeps uh, governance in place. And for example, in protected areas, Often uh, rangers, for example, are harmed at best, uh, may be killed, uh, or they, they have to flee for other reasons. Um, and so we tend to see an interruption to conservation work that is, is happening in those places. Uh, and we often see species killed, endangered species, for example, may be wiped out in some areas, uh, taken for uh, food maybe, um, but also sometimes, as we know, taken uh, for criminal gang motives, uh, and traded or, or sold, for example. And I think somebody already mentioned the, the looting of minerals and other conflict resources. <clears throat> so very briefly then, um, how does the law protect in armed conflict? And as I said, I focus on uh, protected zones, protected environmental areas. 
So many people in the room may know much more about uh, international environmental law treaties, such as the Convention on Biodiversity, uh, the UNFCCC, the Climate Change Convention, CITES, which is Trade in Endangered Species, Ramsar, which is about wetlands, and then heritage sites, for example. So, so these conventions, uh, species and habitats are often protected, and the general approach is often to designate an area as a protected area. And in that area, you have obviously conservation efforts going on. And the more modern approach to this is that you will have the local community very engaged with that, very, um, in a very much sort of uh, symbiotic way. And particularly where you have indigenous populations, for example. However, when an armed conflict, oh, sorry, conflict breaks out, uh, the environmental law treaties tend to say very little about their uh, continued role during the conflict. Uh, do they continue in operation? What sort of obligations do they include that protect the protected areas during such times? You know, the fragile species, the habitat. What happens to the rangers? Certainly, the ability of the conventions to protect environmental spaces in what we call the hot conflict zone, where you have uh, the main warfare taking place, the main use of weapons, for example, is very limited. It's very limited that these environmental treaties can continue with uh, having their obligations um, being enforced on the ground. Often people flee, of course, and there are other issues to deal with. Uh, so the main laws then uh, that are applicable to protect the environment uh, and these environmental protected areas during armed conflict is international humanitarian law. So I've listed the five main rules on the slide and, and I think I've just alluded to some of them. And I won't go to, into these in detail. Uh, but the things like the principle of distinction or, or discrimination, it's often uh, called, you have to discriminate uh, as the military between civilian and military targets, only targeting the military objectives. Proportionality, which is the rule that I've just uh, talked about in a little bit more detail about the, the scale of collateral damage. There's also notions of precautions, uh, the idea of being to warn, for example, the civilian population, but also from the environmental perspective uh, to, well, to try to spare the environment as much as possible. Uh, and then there are some provisions which are specific to environmental uh, protections, uh, but they have a very high threshold. And so we very rarely see the, 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 the notion of widespread, long-term and severe environmental damage of that particular provision. We very rarely see it um, in operation, so to speak. It, it, doesn't really have, um, it doesn't really have much of a use, if I can put it that way, unfortunately, in practice. So focusing on protected areas, uh, then international humanitarian law doesn't contain a specific provision to protect these environmental spaces. So we have lots of treaties in peacetime that do this, and most of our uh, conservation work, habitat work, is in protected areas, because that's how we set them up in peacetime. But during armed conflict, they just, in, in a way, they just sort of disappear into the ether. Um, literally maybe and figur figuratively, because there's no specific provision stopping the military well, bulldozing straight across it, uh, using it strategically, um, and, 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 and targeting, obviously, if, uh, depending on what it contains. So does it contain a military objective? You can uh, have designated areas under the main laws of war, but it's never been done. So there's no specific provision. And this is, I think, particularly more urgent now that we get to the point of having the triple planetary crisis. So now we, now we know um, that we're facing the, the, the highest, the, the speediest rate of biodiversity loss uh, ever, you know, the highest rates of pollution, and we've got the climate crisis. Then I think we're going to, well, we know we're going to have to see we're going to have to designate more areas as protected areas in peacetime. And so therefore, in armed conflict, it's going to be even more of a tragedy when I think more of these places um, are damaged and destroyed during armed conflict. So there's a bit more momentum, I think, at the minute on this point. So I think what Sarah mentioned at the beginning is there, there have been, well, there has been a number of studies, one by the Red Cross, uh, but another by the International Law Commission, 
the ILC, the International Law Commission, uh, is a body of the, the United Nations, and they spent about 13 years looking at uh, all the rules in this area, gathering, gathering lots of practice. And they came up with the 2022, what we call PEREC principles, the principles on protection of the environment in relation to armed conflict. And when it comes to protected areas, they suggested uh, that, uh, a couple of approaches, uh, or at least a threefold approach. First of all, in principle four, uh, they encourage states to designate uh, environmental spaces uh, as protected in peacetime, which is what happens. And then during armed conflict, the idea is under principle 18 that these uh, EPZs, or environmental protect and protected zones, sorry, will continue, but only with the agreement of use of the state's party. If it's a non-international armed conflict, then the agreement would need to be between the state itself and the armed group or groups, plural. So the idea is that they need to be created through agreement, rather than simply rolling over from whatever the designation is in peacetime. And the idea of that agreement is really a necessity because without the states and armed groups, for example, agreeing to designate an area as protected, then it just it won't tend to happen for one thing. You need that agreement. But of course, from the start, that will limit how many zones, how many of these could be, or will in practice, uh, be negotiated. Uh, and then the idea is that uh, these, these zones could not contain a military objective, otherwise they, they wouldn't have any protected status. So they couldn't contain communication towers uh, or similar. Otherwise, as I say, they would lose that, lose that status legitimately. Um, but I think these, so the question then is, is of itself though, uh, these agreements, would they fully protect uh, the EPZ, the Environmental Protection Zone? Um, because I think one, as I've mentioned, one of the main, or two of the main areas of damage for environmental protected areas is that uh, legal vacuum, the, the, the lack of governance, for example, uh, and also this idea of the military footprint. So whilst the EPZ formula might prevent the environmental protected area being a target itself, so one of the, uh, again, going back to two of the main um, dimensions, the targeting and the weapons use, two, as I say, are not contained within this. So the military footprint, you might still get through that. And you might get uh, refugees, for example, who need that safe space. So you might still get impacts on the uh, environment. So where do we start, though, with this? First of all, there's an argument that we, how do we start to designate such areas? I said they have to be by agreement, but where physically on the land do you start? We have a lot of these obviously designated, as I say, under various treaties. But I think as Doug and his research has, has shown, is that in Ukraine, for example, uh, all of these areas are not currently mapped. And, and, and I can guarantee it's the same for every state on the planet. Uh, they're, they're not currently mapped in peacetime. So if it just suddenly you know, in, enters an armed conflict phase, the idea that we suddenly know where the boundaries are is, is quite fanciful. Secondly, in relation to designating these areas, then strategically, some of these areas uh, would be problematic to designate. For example, I think we, we had a, an earlier discussion, and a lot of them will be, des will, will be uh, located, for example, down the borders between states. And so, of course, that might be the main thoroughfare, so to speak, from one state to invade into another. And so, again, strategically, some of these couldn't be designated. So one of the key issues we have to figure out, or states would have to figure out, is how to designate, how to get to that agreement between them. And then, of course, how to protect them, and how to protect the, well, the, the fragile, unique, endangered habitat that they contain. So we need a lot of this to be done, I think, and thought about what, I, what we call during peacetime, uh, in order to know how more easily to translate it uh, into armed conflict. And one of the things that we're also looking at is the treaty bodies. So all of these conventions have a particular treaty body that oversees the implementation and, the, and keeps it up to date. 
one of the things that we're trying to do is get those treaty bodies to think a bit more about armed conflict or, or to get their state members to think a bit more about armed conflict and how and why, for example, they would designate particular areas and to think about practical support on the ground. What information, you know, in these three scenarios we had from just my colleagues, what information, what practical or financial aid uh, is needed on the ground to help the local population, for example, the local rangers, to try to ensure that the conservation efforts can continue. So, uh, thank you. Oh, there you go. Thanks. So, one question, um, and then we're going to ask all the speakers to, to come up for a question and answer session. Good evening. Thank you for your talk. Um, with regards to the international law and the enforceability of any treaties that are brought into play, we've already seen through various conflicts that the International Court of Justice is effectively toothless when the UN Security Council cannot reach a resolution. How will this legislation actually be enforced would be my question. Um. So, so I guess that there are two different areas of law here. Uh, one is environmental law and the other is armed conflict, uh, IHL. <clears throat> uh, environmental law is, well, I guess from a legal perspective, I don't know how many lawyers are in the room, but from a legal perspective, um, there is always an issue with compliance. You know, how many people driving on the road don't, you know, stop at 70. So there is always a compliance gap. Uh, and that, isn't, that shouldn't be the answer, but unfortunately that is often the starting point. Uh, and particularly when we look at international law, we have to remember that international law is created by states. So whilst academics and others, we, we try to push them along and we try to you know, get them thinking about this and, and, um, and creating more law. At the end of the day, if the states do not want to create it, then it doesn't get created. An international law system is created by states, and obviously I, we can all see the loopholes there. So yes, I mean, admittedly, there is a huge compliance gap, whether it's environmental law, whether it's uh, the laws of armed conflict. The question, though, again, for, for any lawyers, particularly international lawyers, is what would the situation be without it? So if this is the situation with it, what is the situation without it? Uh, and you can imagine it would be a lot worse. There's always a, a variety of ways in which states, of course, do or don't I'm finishing, do or don't uh, abide by their uh, obligations. Um, but I think, for the most part, states do try to. Um, but as yeah, it's that unfortunately is the answer. That there's no, there's no easy answer, and um, this is why the International Criminal Court was created. But again, it, it can only really look at a very small, very small fraction of cases. And, and of course, it has to choose uh, the, the most egregious. I'm just going to kick off with a question um, that's probably more to Susan. Because um, I'm, I'm interested to know how much value um, local stakeholders attach to nature conservation in the area that you work um, compared to the other pressures they face. So, how much value do they put on the elephants, for example? Well, in the, um, yes, they, they, they attach, so the, 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 that, was, that was the key kind of realization was when we, when we were looking at the attitudes um, in, initially to elephants, we realized that actually, because they're people who live very close to the, to the ground, they actually see themselves and the environment and the animals and creatures that live there, you know, as part of one system. So there is, there's that attitude, you know, it's part of their identity and they see elephants as indicators of the health of that ecosystem. However, on the other hand, you've also got, you know, like as in Degra, you know, you've got a lot of hunting happening, um, and that seemed to be a result of a combination of people coming from outside to hunt local um, animals, but, but also um, sometimes local people hunting because they think, if I don't get that gazelle, then somebody else is going to. 
So there's a, a lack of environmental government systems. So once we realized that, we realized that there were good attitudes, but the incentive structure for people to realize those attitudes needed to be put in place. So once they had rules, for example, about hunting, you know, how many could be taken in their particular area, and that everybody was subject to the same rules, then they're, then they're willing to respect that. You know, it's a way for them to manifest their, their inherent um, values. Does, does that make sense? Thank you. Hi. Um, armed conflict. Um, th this is a... So you, I think you said earlier, the, the last speaker, you said about armed conflict. Um, and environmental are separate or something, something you said like that. My question is that, and this is sort of rolling back around full, full circle to my question earlier, which is when I've spoken to people in Africa and India who are on the ground, who are Africans, Indians or Chinese, they're actually telling me, and I've actually done the research myself, that to get the res to all these resources that we need for this Green New Deal, and it actually is in, every, in almost all across Africa where the conflicts are happening, where the trees are being stripped down and f deforested, this is exactly the problem. But no one seems to be talking about it. There's so much focus on we need to divest from fossil fuels. That's the evil nemesis in the room. But there's no looking at the fact that you speak to any African or Indian person and actually ask, how are you actually mining these resources for the electric car without burning fossil fuels? It's like, you must be joking, you can't. So the question is, is when are we actually going to have a holistic conversation and actually saying that the fossil fuels is not in a separate part of mine from the lithium and the cobalt and the bauxite? And along with it comes the human rights abuses. So those people that you're helping is great but then their fellow Africans on another part of that country are being completely ravaged or they're ravaging their own lands um, to serve the military industrial complex who need to use their fighter pilots to actually get into the country. They need to use their military hardware and their men to actually get into the country and take the resources. And th this is something that no one's speaking about. The best example of this right now is Western Africa, Niger. Before I forget, Niger has kicked out France in the last few months after six years of colonial control. And the reason why France is beating down and not going to leave so easily is because they need the uranium. And the uranium is the main backup energy all renewables across France. So they're going to keep their feet in the country along with the Americans. So my question is that when are we going to have holistic conversations on all these resources in their entirety and in spaces like this, where are the environmental experts who are of African and Indian and Chinese and South African origin to actually say, I'm from there. I can actually tell you a whole lot more what's going on. But if we're, if we're talking about this, we have to talk about all the, the issues connected to those people that you're helping. Um, and I'm, for me, I'm really frustrated. <laughs> I'm really frustrated in, in seeing this, this um, narrow lens of divest from fossil fuels. But let's not look at the cobalt. Let's not look at these people are ravaging, destroying our lands. For, for the global north. And it's not the companies that are responsible, the green activists, the climate change activists, say, oh, go after the companies. No, the companies are mining those minerals because of the demand from the global north who want to go green. But the green is coming with human and environmental rights abuses, and me and my people in India and my fellow people in Africa are losing their land to go green, not for fossil fuels. Yeah, thank you. I mean, thank you for the intervention. I think it's important to hear, and it was quite clear the frustration that that was there. Um, and to be sure, yes, there is a holistic conversation to be had because we're all aware here that um, climate change and livelihood crisis cannot be seen um, separate. And there is also, I think this is very true, and I don't think anyone in the room here would uh, would disagree with that, 
a, a need for conservation to become more equitable, but I would say in the, this is, you know, we're just four people giving a flavor of the type of work that happens here. We're not representative, and we don't claim to be representative of the work that happens. But what I would suggest is there is actually a lot of work going on in these areas, and there are, there are people working on this, and um, yeah. Um, I mean, if, if you are interested in talking about that later, do reach out. Um, but I would just, so to say your frustration is valid, I share many of them, but this is maybe not the necessarily the, so. Just maybe add, just on this wider question of um, intersectionality, which I think you're pointing at between the environmental movement and climate movements and others. <coughs> um, so yeah, I think there's still a huge gap. So we do a lot of work around military emissions and around conflict, greenhouse gas emissions, which obviously crosses over between these two areas. And it is an uphill battle to try and get climate campaigners irrespective of where they are in the world, to engage in this space. So COP just now has been, yeah, a huge step along the way because of the context and the background of Gaza and of Ukraine. There's a, huge, a lot more attention on the relationship between conflicts, peace, security, climate change, and all of these related factors. It's clear that the climate movement generally is still not making the case and articulating it, these relationships as clearly as they could be. And part of that is also the issue around the visibility of the environment and conflict, which still doesn't get a, very much attention in the wider context of coverage of conflict. So there's multiple blocking actions there uh, before people are going to be talking about this stuff and these relationships in more detail, I'd say. I was just going to say this gentleman here actually really highlights the importance of dealing with the people on the ground. And this gentleman here highlights the importance it is of dealing with the people on the ground. You were talking about it with the elephants. If you get the indigenous populations and the people who live in there actually um, to be interested in the resources and sharing out the resources fairly and claiming it for themselves, that that's what we really need to see um, across the globe. And my question that I wanted to ask earlier was, do you think that these EPZs that you potentially could build could actually reduce conflict by bringing communities more closer together? So yes, I hope so. Um, I, think, I think a lot of it's done in peacetime, though. Um, so the EPZ idea is, is, is purely once an armed conflict has uh, started. Um, sorry, <coughs> I've got a bit of a cold. Um, I think a lot of work is already done in peacetime. But the, the use, there's a number of years ago, there was a, a concept called peace parks. And again, a lot of these are along the borders. Um, some of them more successful than others. So I think there is a lot of work that's happened in that area, in that space anyway. And I think a lot of, a lot of environmental law is often about getting local, well, local uh, states together, for example, for, with a common resource. So a lot of uh, areas where it's quite dry, which are quite um, water um, scarce, actually get together and talk about it and how to, um, how to, or divide it up between them, so to speak, how to each, well, try to have an equitable share. So I think a lot of conflicts actually have the environment, well, or maybe prevented because they have this, neighboring states often have a, they've already spent many years trying to equitably share their resources, or at least if, you know, if, if one pollutes the other, then uh, they will also be the subject to pollution. So a lot of neighboring states tend to have this. Obviously, the, there's also a lot of conflict though, between neighbors, let's not forget that. So I, think, so I think it is more limited during armed conflict is the thing that I was talking about. Longevity though, the idea of creating them is before the conflict and then hopefully they, they continue during to some extent. And then of course after the conflict, which I didn't get to talk about uh, because of time, but after the conflict is obviously the recovery period as well. But yes, I mean the, the idea would be to try and get the local community and that, I think that's the more modern example, more modern approach to setting up these protected areas uh, to ensure that local indigenous populations you know, are working very closely with the environment and they have uh, a high value for the environment. I don't know if that answered your question at all. I'm sorry. <coughs> Maybe just, um, just follow up on, on Karen. I think, um, so historically, there was a very Malthusian approach towards natural resources and conflict, that if you had resources, it was a resource curse you invariably got conflict. <clears throat> but for the last 15, 20 years, it's been the kind of emergent field of environmental peace building, which looks at how 
the environment can be used to build and sustain peace, particularly in conflict settings or fragile settings. And I think these uh, policies and processes and projects are, they have to be driven from the bottom up. And I think the example from Mali before was a really good case of like, harvesting resources here is far better and safer than joining an armed group. So I think there's an awful lot of work being done in this space by a whole community of practice. The Environmental Peacebuilding Association is kind of a hub of it, which you can join as a member. And there's, yeah, there's people globally looking at these ways where you can look at co cooperation over environmental risk and environmental stress in ways which don't lead to peace, but don't lead to conflict, but can lead to peace and sustainable peace at that. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ben, and uh, thank you very much uh, to all of you. I wanted to, to pick up on this idea of um, post-conflict reconstruction, um, because it, it seems to me that uh, it, it's probably going to be difficult, if not impossible, to get parties to a, to a live conflict to focus on the environment. Um, but afterwards is when you know you have the most productive opportunity and perhaps when um, we in in Europe might be play the most prominent role because uh, there'll often be a huge focus on um, post-conflict reconstruction and uh, to pick up on on Ukraine I guess my question is uh, what more can we do to get uh, governments and, and the UK in particular to kind of focus on the environment as a as a part of post-conflict reconstruction so I know that there's already been a sort of uh, conference about uh, reconstruction in Ukraine um, even now uh, and looking at the future and what, what should be done when the fighting eventually stops. Uh, so I don't know whether the environment was a part of that and whether there are efforts to kind of try and center it in the, the discourse around uh, reconstruction. So just interested in all of your views on that. Um, should I go first? Um, so there's been the recovery conferences, the international ones. There's one in Lugano in Switzerland. There's one here in London. I think it was the view from Ukrainian civil society organizations like uh, EcoAction who attended that the environment wasn't prom prominent enough and sustainable recovery wasn't prominent enough. Um, and it remains the case. And there are people working for the Ukrainian government <laughs> uh, currently looking at how nature can be a former part of recovery. Um, and there's, yeah, Ukraine's going to be an interesting example. There is, has been far more donor interest and attention in Ukraine from rich Western countries than you typically get in a conflict. Um, at the same time, it's come at a point where there's increased environmental awareness, increased concern over climate adaptation and mitigation. It's the first conflict where there's been an effort to actually track what it's done to emissions in Ukraine. So there's this sort of growing momentum around the need for sustainable recovery and is this the point where Ukraine can successfully transition from its former emissions heavy economy to a sustainable recovery that involves nature and climate mitigation and adaptation. The jury is out on whether donor interest and attention will be sustained for long enough to ensure that happens and it obviously relates to the, con the trajectory of the conflict and whatever else happens internationally but it seems, on paper at least, the best opportunity yet for ensuring that the environment sustainability feature in post-conflict reconstruction, because they generally don't, wherever you look in you know, Iraq, Syria, Yemen. Ukraine seems different because of the donor attention on it. But if we fail there, then, yeah, it doesn't really hold out much hope for other conflicts in future. Just on, on broaden it out from Ukraine, if I can, that, um, so from what's called the transitional justice <coughs> approach, there's been lots of transitional justice processes over the last 80 odd years, um, but only in the very, very recent ones has the environment really been a focus. And the, the main one at the minute, which we're all focusing on, is Colombia, uh, where, the, um, where there was a mixed approach, I think, uh, or mixed results, I guess, for the environment in Colombia. Um, because, well, FARC, some of the armed groups, in one sense, were protecting the environment, but not in, not in the way maybe we ordinarily think of that, or at least because they were on the lands and the environment wasn't necessarily attacked. Um, but of course, at the same time, they, they stole those lands. You know, they, they were taking those lands from indigenous communities. So the Colombian peace process has a, 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 well, a key chapter on the environment. And I think I was over there a few months back. One of the, the key things that the, the HEP, the, the, the Special Justice for Peace, is looking at is that the environment being evicted, the, the, the 
called it the victim of the armed conflict, and that will bring certain rights. Um, truth, for example, reconciliation, all of those things. And they're trying to figure out what that might mean. But these are largely indigenous, well, these are indigenous lands. So this is the indigenous landscape, the, you know, the spiritual um, heritage of the land. How that translates to a non-indigenous country, a country without indigenous peoples, for example, will be interesting to see over the next 10 to 15 years. But I think it's a really good example of where you have uh, that very close connection with the land, and it, it, was, it was stolen from them, and the and indigenous people have lost, lost that connection. And of course, they, they might have lost a lot of their heritage with it. Thank you very much for all of your talks. Um, I was really interested to hear about uh, the sort of smaller scale community projects and the real world impact that they can have in a small time. But that led me to think, ask a question of, as climate change is likely to exacerbate resource scarcity and food insecurity um, through like a range of processes like desertification and things like that, do you foresee these protected zones that you're creating actually coming under increased threat um, and becoming potentially a center, uh, a source of conflict? Uh, and also, I guess, attached to that, um, but on a wider scale, do you foresee a shift to smaller scale, maybe like guerrilla style conflicts as opposed to large state conflict? And how might that present challenges for enforcement of this environmental protection and the long-term benefits of these community projects? I could jump in with one, one or two thoughts, sorry, and maybe. Um, <coughs> it has long been the case that um, the state versus state, so. Russia versus Ukraine type conflict is a, is a tiny fraction of the armed conflicts around the world. It's long been the case that um, what we call low intensity or non-international armed conflicts uh, are vastly more in number. Um, and the, the, the range of impacts on the environment can vary. And, and generally it depends on well, how, long the conflict, how long the conflict occurs for, um, but also the types of weapons that are used as well. Uh, normally, a, a, a non-international, normally a non-international armed conflict, or sort of low intensity, is often called, or civil war, whatever we want to call it. Normally, they're not the big scale weapons we're used to seeing. For example, the big bombs, missiles, and whatnot. Uh, so, normally, the environmental—I say normally a lot—but normally, the environmental damage tends to be on a lower scale, and we tend to see, you know, regeneration. Uh, one of the big examples we often use is the, the DRC, um, where the, the gorilla, for example, in, in the forests of the DRC were, uh, well, heavily impacted at one point, and then there was protection. Um, so I think I'll, I'll start with that, but um, it, it always depends on uh, the, the scale of the conflict, the weapons, all of those things. Um, and then I'll see if anybody else wants to jump in. Sorry. I don't want to hog. Well, I, I just... Um, it, it does depend on the, the local situation quite a bit. And certainly in Mali, uh, in jihadist insurgencies in, in arid lands, they actually like the tree cover. And so they'll often invade protected areas because those, if you look at a satellite map of um, West Africa, and particularly at Burkina Faso, you see the protected areas because they're the ones still with trees. And it's no accident that the, um, the insurgent groups you know, like to be uh, to like to be there, and um, so they, that has a um, one impact. On the other hand, when it comes to wildlife, you know, trafficking um, wildlife parts, you know, food, you know, it will clear out. It, you know, um, war will generally clear out the wildlife. So the actual local conditions depend you depend a bit on what happens, but that, there's certainly the dynamics in uh, in West Africa. So maybe the one thing to add is um, that conflict's not inevitable as a result of climate change, and there's that risk that if we say, well, because of climate change, we're going to get conflict, it risks masking the underlying conditions, economic, social conditions, which actually are the main triggers of conflict, which may be exacerbated by climate change or resource scarcity, but it's not inevitable that conflict will ensue. And I think historically with climate change, there's been a lot of effort to frame climate security as a threat to state security to try and get the attention of governments so they will fund more work for think tanks saying these things, but also get militaries to engage on climate change, which might then persuade the wider populace to engage on climate change. And actually, it's only now that we're starting to see that discourse shift from 
state-centric security <laughs> risks to more focus on fragility and conflict and what that means for vulnerability and exposure for communities and what can be done to address that and what can be done to address the massive funding differentials for climate adaptation, for example. So one good case in the Middle East is uh, if you look at the amount of money which goes to Jordan and Egypt for climate adaptation, it's about 10 or 15 times as much as goes to Iraq, Syria or Yemen despite the clear need there because of the environmental degradation caused by decades of conflict in some cases. So we need to kind of interrogate the role of climate in conflict, not see it just as a trigger or cause of conflict in and of itself, but yeah, something which may exacerbate underlying factors and historical injustice and, and everything else. Yeah, and just a, a little other, other, other dimension on that. Um, you know, actually, uh, you know, a very good sort of way to for for people to to combat the the climate is to restore those natural e ecosystems you know because that's a very good you know the, especially in the dry lands which tend to be affected first you know the, the natural ecosystems are naturally um resilient to in big environmental change so actually bringing back those ecosystems is a is a is a good way to try and mitigate those those climate impacts Hey, um, thanks. I think we're out of time, I'm afraid. Um, so it remains me to thank all our speakers for their fascinating and thought-provoking presentations, and to all of you for making the journey here and to for asking and engaging and asking your questions. Um, so thanks very much. So our next science and conservation event will be in January, and that's going to be celebrating 10 years of our garden wildlife health project at ZSL. So keep an eye on the What's On page on the website for further updates. Please also let us know what you thought of tonight's event in our feedback survey, and thank you for coming, and good night. <laughs>